This is historic Red Lion Square on the corner of Bloomsbury in London, where Cromwell's body lay en route from Westminster Abbey to Tyburn, and where Robert Owen had his centre and where William Morris lived. And in the corner here is Conway Hall, the home of the South Place Ethical Society. My name's Peter Cadogan, I'm the General Secretary, and upstairs is our library and meeting room, and we'll go up there now. This is the library. We use it for meetings, and at the far end, we use it for our office. And this is where I sit during the meetings. I'm going to tell you, and we're going to show you, the story of continuity and change since the day we began, 182 years ago, on the 14th of February, 1793. There may be for some lessons for us today. We began as a gathered church, a church gathered round one man, a man with a message, in Hallen Winchester. He was born in our American colonies, as they then were, and he had a powerful new message, new in those days, that is, that there was no hell, that God is love, and that all men are or ought to be brothers. He called his church Universalist and Philadelphian, and from the Huguenots exiled in London, he hired a chapel in Parliament Court. And that chapel still stands today, used by the Jews for the last hundred years. Winchester soon went back to America and was followed by William Vidler. And when, in 1802, the Unitarians also abandoned belief in hell, our chapel joined their fold. The great days, though, began in 1817, when William Johnson Fox, whose portrait's over there, took over as minister. At his induction, his commitment, and that of the society, was to free inquiry to religious and civil liberty all over the world. He immediately entered the struggle to defend the publication of the works of Thomas Paine, whose original portrait is also on our walls. But Fox was a young man living in lodgings, and he desperately wanted a home of his own. And to get it, he made a, a marriage that he instantly regretted. He was soon plunged into a nervous breakdown that lasted for 12 months. And his recovery is partly the story of a famous romance that shook religious and literary London. His good friend Benjamin Flower had two beautiful daughters, Sarah and Eliza. They joined his congregation, and soon Eliza became indispensable to him both personally and in his work. They stayed apart for 11 years. And in those 11 years, Fox worked like a man possessed. A new chapel was built at South Place, and the society moved in in 1824 to stay there for 103 years. This is what it looked like. And the building on the site today has pillars where ours were, and a brass plaque identifies the site. We retain the name of the location in the name of the society today. Our chapel became a famous center for new religious ideas and for social ideas too. Catholic emancipation, the ending of slavery, Robert Owen's cooperative notions <coughs> and secular education and so on. The Unitarians, like the Quakers, were the quiet, intensive pacemakers of their day. Fox bought the magazine, the monthly repository, and helped to found the Westminster Review. Then in 1834, Fox and Eliza decided to stall no longer and to set up house together. The official Unitarian Church was scandalized, but South Place wasn't. Fox was tried and in his absence was expelled from that Unitarian Church. But South Place stuck by its minister and Eliza. And as an independent religious society, we went on from strength to strength. Fox's ministry lasted 35 years until, as MP for Oldham, he decided to devote his de final years to his work in the House of Commons and as a writer. And after his departure, we had a rather poor time until the arrival of Moncure Conway in 1864. That's a painting of him above my head, and an earlier one shows what it looked like when he arrived here in 1864. He remained with us over a period of 33 years. In 1869, he came to the committee and said, I can no longer pray. It was another turning point in the history of the society. We went along with him and changed prayers to readings and to singing ethical hymns as in our hymn book. 
and they were sung until 1961. We committed ourselves anew, translating the original message in a new way. The objects of this society are the study and dissemination of ethical principles and the cultivation of a rational religious sentiment. In 1887, we began our concerts, and in 95, the monthly journal, now called The Ethical Record, edited by Eric Willoughby. We were taking the path, later to be charted by the most advanced theologians of the 20th century. <clears throat> After Conway's departure, our trustees and general committee, and the AGM, decided not to have a minister to replace him, but to have a panel of appointed lecturers. And here they are, shown on the panel downstairs in our vestibule, by the 1920s, we'd outgrown our aging chapel in South Place. And we bought a site in Red Lion Square here and built Conway Hall itself, moving in in 1929. Our five public rooms are let to all without religious or political discrimination. We practice our belief in free inquiry. We make no profit, only a small loss. And as a society, we are concerned with people, with values, with ideas, for the arts for truth and all the enduring non-material things. We try to live up to the word that's inscribed on our proscenium arch in the large hall, to thine own self be true. Our Sunday program, because Sunday's our main day, starts with a morning, me meeting in the morning at 11 o'clock. There's a forum on controversial subjects in the afternoon, a concert at 6.30 in the evening, and while the concert is playing, people are praying bridge in the library. And we'll take you through a fairly typical day at Sunday at South Place. Good morning. This morning, Tony Krasner is with us and going to sing two songs, the, the Marriage Brokers song and a song from The Bartered Bride by Smetna. Tony Krasner. Now please to understand, sir, your word is good with me, sir, if you sign that you agree, sir. I know what I'm about, I trust you won't back out, just sign upon the dotted line and everything is fine, oh yes, with nothing left to doubt. This morning it's our pleasure to welcome back Anthony Flew, a friend of the society for some time. And he's chosen, he's professor of philosophy, of course, at Reading University, and he's chosen as his subject this morning, Sartre and Freedom. Professor Flew. What I'm, I've got to say this morning is going, like Gaul, to be divided into three parts. The first part will be an account of what the philosophical problems of free will and determinism actually are. In the second part, I shall begin by giving an account of what Sartre says about freedom in the chapter on freedom in his vast and unreadable book, Being and Nothingness. Having in that second part explained what he says, I will then proceed to argue that his case for his conclusions will not support the conclusions which he tries to derive from it. Then, in the third part, I will uh, try to show that substantially these conclusions can be more clearly and validly uh, justified in another way. Well, that's what I hope to do. Now for part one. Has point and value. Compare the more particular case of responding to the excuse of a general and chronic lack of time by insisting, equally tautologically, that everyone's day contains no less and no more than the same 24 hours. If I have time for this but not for that, it can only be not because I have less time in the days of my life than other people do, but because I choose to spend my time not upon that but upon this. Thank you, Professor. We'll take the collection and I'll make the announcements. We'll take your questions and his reply is straight away. Sartre seems to be very incomprehensible when he's writing these things that you gave us some examples of in textbooks. Why does he write like that when 
he can write so marvellously. Um, when I saw his play Cream Passionelle, I thought it was really just about the most marvellous play I'd ever seen. Uh, I think the answer to this is that it's all part of the bad influence of German philosophy on Sartre. Um, uh, he's taken up with uh, Hegel and Heidegger and all the worst of the Germans, and it's, uh, I believe, Hegel uh, thought that you had to be obscure, and uh, this was, you know, part of the occupational requirement. It won't surprise you that I've never read uh, Sartre's being a non-being, so I'm only depending on you for this, but it seems to me that you've buried everything with the word intention, which he clearly must expound upon somewhere, and intention must imply choice, because if there were no choice, there would be no need of intention. Mr. Dennis Campbell and myself are authorised persons, authorised to conduct weddings in Conway Hall. The last couple to be married here were Peter and Geraldine Simpson, and with their help, we have recreated the ceremony. Good afternoon, everybody, and hello to you too. Peter Simpson and Geraldine Etherington have come here in affection and honor to say before us that they will henceforth share their home, combine in mutual living and responsibility, and give their joint support to the life of the community. Love is the wish of the whole self to unite with another to the end of personal completeness. Touched by this love, nature yields tenderness, togetherness, simplicity, honesty, and delight. When a man and woman openly and sincerely declare their affection for each other, they are affirming the precious truth that love is the foundation of all life. Between man and woman, between parents and children, between relatives, between friends, and as goodwill between all mankind. Hence, we who are present here are witness not only to a legal act, but also to a deeper truth. In the name of the community we represent, we ask this man and this woman to speak in truth to one another and to repeat in the spirit of faithful engagement these words of declaration that bind them together. Now, will you, Peter, say after me? I do solemnly declare. I do solemnly declare. That I know not of any lawful impediment. That I know not of any lawful impediment. Why I, Peter Simpson. Why I, Peter Simpson. May not be joined in matrimony. May not be joined in matrimony. To Geraldine Ann Etherington. To Geraldine Ann Etherington. And will you, Geraldine, say after me? I do solemnly declare. I do solemnly declare. That I know not of any lawful impediment. As I know not of any lawful impediment. Why I, Geraldine Ann Etherington. Why I, Geraldine Ann Etherington. May not be joined in matrimony. May not be joined in matrimony. To Peter Simpson. To Peter Simpson. Yes. Now, will you, Peter, repeat after me? I call upon you for worse. For richer or for poorer. For, for richer or for, for poorer. poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and, and in health. health. And to love and to cherish. And to love and to cherish. As long as we may live. As long as we may live. I pronounce you man and wife. On sadder occasions, we conduct funerals too. Here's part of our ceremony. There is a time for all things. A time for living and a time for dying. In the words of Bertrand Russell, an individual human existence should be like a river small at first, narrowly confined within its banks and rushing passionately past boulders and over waterfalls. Gradually, the river grows wider, the banks recede, the waters flow more quietly, and in the end, without any visible break, they become merged in the sea and painlessly lose their individual being. The man or woman who in old age can see his or her life in this way will not suffer from the fear of death since the things they care for will continue. And if, with the decay of vitality, weariness increases, the thought of rest will not be unwelcome. The wise should wish to die while still at work, knowing that others will carry on what they can no longer do, and content in the thought that what was possible has been done.
At our Sunday forums, we aim much more at the topical and at the controversial. And our guest on this occasion was Mr. John Beloff, and his subject, parapsychology. Well, uh, being a parapsychologist, as I've discovered to my cost, is something of a social embarrassment. Uh, when I'm introduced to uh, people at uh, social gatherings, I tend to refrain for as long as possible from mentioning the fact because I've always found that it queers the pitch of the conversation. And I think this is uh, symptomatic uh, of the ambiguous status which parapsychology now has uh, in present day society. It's almost bad enough uh, having to admit to being a psychologist. I mean, this can generate its own misunderstandings, but parapsychology is worse. Um, people just don't know quite how to take it. They don't know where it belongs uh, on the great divide that separates uh, well-established knowledge, firm facts, from that vast uh, subterranean world of uh, irrational beliefs of pseudosciences and superstitions. And I thought that uh, probably the most useful thing I could do in this talk today would be uh, to try and explain why um, there has so far been no consensus uh, about the status of parapsychology amongst those who are competent to judge, and at the same time offer you uh, a few uh, pointers and guidelines so that you can make up your own minds, which I'm sure is what you want to do. The mind-body problem. I mean, philosophers have uh, debated whether the mind uh, is, in the last resort, identical to the brain, a function of brain processes, or whether it is some mysterious extra that somehow uses the brain. Uh, and uh, Undoubtedly, I mean, if you take the most straightforward and simplest interpretation, psychic phenomena uh, look uh, like it being a case uh, of where the mind is acting independently of the brain. So um, this undoubtedly is bound to put the whole mind-body uh, uh, debate back into uh, a melting pot. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Beloff. I'll just make the announcements and then we'll go straight into questions after that. This evening's concert's given by the uh, Northern Symphonia Ensemble, playing in the large hall. That's more than the quartet. There's about uh, eight players, I think, playing works by Schubert Spohr uh, in the large hall at 6.30. The entrance course is 25p, as usual. Next uh, Tuesday's meeting is opened by John Wilman, and his subject is... Uh, ecstasy, that's at 7 o'clock. Uh, next Sunday morning, Lord Brock Brockway will be with us, and he will be talking about a spiritual evolution from Christianity to humanism. A bridge in the library tonight, and there's a new display of books for your inspection on the bookstall. So we'll take the questions and discussions now, and I'll get rid of the lectern for us. That's better. Um, um, you mentioned the low order of priority given to this subject. I remember hearing many years ago in this hall, J.N. Tyrrell, who is now dead, of course, he was president of the Society of Psychic Research, and his thesis was that, for example, when evolution was becoming, if you believe in it, the real bigots were the church people, the, the bishops and so on, because they thought everything would topple if it were true. Now, he said the bigots of the present time are the scientists, the orthodox scientists. Yeah. Oh. Inevitably, if enough re experiments are done on a subject, some will give a favourable result for any phenomenon. Couldn't, that, couldn't this be part of the explanation for experiments that give a favourable result? Is it, well, if anything is possible, then it will happen in the end. Uh, well, uh, I think that this is a terribly important point um, where you're dealing with uh, so-called conventional levels of significance. That's to, I, I'm talking now about experiments that come out with odds of 100 to 1 against this being a chance result. Now, I know for a fact, for example, that J.B. Ryan will only publish positive results in his Journal of Parapsychology, and I hope very much hold it, hold it against him, and I've argued very strongly with him that this is wrong policy in a scientist. Coffee breaks, teas, lunches, dinners, and parties are important at South Place. A lot of work goes into their preparation. Our breaking of bread is for real. 
After a forum, we reset the library and settled down to typical conviviality. Percy Sumter has been a member of the, uh, of the Society for very many years. Can you sort of throw your mind back to what it was like in the old days in the 20s, Percy? Well, London itself was very different in those days, you know, and the South Place uh, was, um, was just a little side street that led into Eldon Street. And um, well, there were small seen... shops on one side and there, were, there was the other uh, chapel on the other. And uh, the chapel was, uh, was, was pulled down for some institution, I forget which it was. But, um, but the, the chapel itself was quite, uh, quite a normal sort of design for, um, for uh, non-conformist chapels of that period. But can you say, uh, for what reason did we actually leave that chapel and come here? Was it not, too, was it not big enough, or what was the reason? Was it too old, or what? No, it was because we got a good offer for, uh, for, for the site. You see, the sites in London were becoming, uh, even then, were becoming... Uh, very expensive, and, yes. and this was wanted for development, and it was, and um, and we wanted to move out of, of London because London was practically empty on Sunday, and it was they, they difficult to get to get, get people to come. Uh, so it was thought that uh, to move to a more live part of London would be uh, be for the good of the society. Now, Rose Bush is a trustee of the society, a member of our general committee and registrar. How would you like to comment on the last 30, 40 years? At that time, there were a number of families whose children had grown up, like uh, uh, the uh, Barrelets and the, um, uh, the Fair Halls, the, uh, the, the Lidstons, yes, thank you, uh, and, and the Salmons and, and Warwicks, yes. And um, I think there was more of a family atmosphere that, that you didn't get so much, so many casual acquaintances as. Um, long-standing friendships um, and uh, and th th this nucleus of um, families uh, used to attend pretty regularly on the Sunday. Are you Tracy out? comes from the States and is not untypical of people who drop in to see us. How did you hear about us, Tracy, and what kind of impression do we make on you? Well, everybody's been very friendly, but it's not exactly that I'm a stranger because I, I was a member of the organization, the equivalent orga organization in the States. Uh -huh. uh, they're known as the Ethical Culture Society, and uh, actually I'm a fourth generation member. You are indeed. So it goes back a long way, and it's nice to be here. This is the rotunda of our long corridor at Conway Hall. We're always experimenting something new, and our latest venture is with paintings. Jim Four Walker was married here a couple of years ago, and he's in the small hall with some of the paintings of our latest exhibition. Let's go through and meet him and see some of the paintings. Jim, tell me about this exhibition and about our exhibitions generally. Well, these paintings are by Bob Jenner. He left Winchester Art School this summer and that's where I saw them. I thought they were very powerful, although I'm not a figurative painter myself, but I thought they had a very strong image quality. This one here, about beehives. I thought it was something to do with Mexico, but in fact it was taken from Hampshire Agricultural College. There's one here, which I think is more recent, which is of a christening, which has got some very nice colour up in the top right. And this one, which is perhaps more typical, is a very bizarre painting, which I think has something to do with politics, but I'm not quite sure what. But again, it has a very vibrant quality to it, Bob's like a lot of young artists who have very little opportunity to show outside the established galleries. And this hall can fulfill quite a useful function. It's the sixth show we've had here, and we hope to carry on with the same sort of program. Group shows, occasional one-man shows as well, all on rather an informal basis, and perhaps a stepping stone to greater things. If paintings are the newest, then music is the oldest of the activities in our society and the arts. And as Mr. George Hutchinson, the secretary of the Concerts Committee, will tell you, George. Our concerts, South Play Sunday concerts, are without parallel, possibly in the world, certainly in the British Isles. Starting in Queen Victoria's Jubilee year, 1887, we have given over 2,150 concerts, about 27 each season from October to April. 
Up to 1940, you could go to them for nothing. But most people could afford to put something in the bowl. And for those few coppers, the finest chimney music played by the finest players in London could be heard. This was in Murgit, in the old Unitarian Chapel, and later, from 1930, in Conroe Hall, Red Lion Square, Holborn. At the concerts in 1902, you could hear Mr. Henry Wood accompany his wife in Leda. In 1920, Mr. John Bob Rolly playing the cello. And in 1930, Myra Hess playing the Schumann piano quintet with the Grilla string quartet. About our programs, if you were to attend regularly for about three years, you would have heard the best of the classics and a good selection of the moderns. Seasons usually have a theme, and modern composers used recently are Schoenberg, Bartok, and Shostakovich. But still mainly the classics, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Brahms, and Dvorak. In short, we are the proms of chamber music. Fortunately for our chamber music, Conway Hall is one of the best of the small halls in the country for sound. Nowadays, our Sunday concerts begin at 6.30. The accent this season is on Schubert's chamber music. All the Mendelssohn string quartets are being played, as well as a number of 20th century string quartets by British composers. The music you are hearing now is taken from a recent concert where the Northern Sinfonia Ensemble played the Spore and Schubert Octet for wind and string. And while the concert proceeds in the large hall, bridge is underway in the library. It's telling. Oh, it's me. You've seen a Sunday at Conway Hall. It remains for me to introduce the seven appointed lecturers who take the place of the minister we used to have. And here they are. Harold Blackham, philosopher, writer, social architect. Richard Clements, OBE. Years in the service of the National London Councils of Social Service, broadcaster and writer. Lord Brockway, still engrossed in his 87th year in the courses to which he's given a lifetime of service. Dr. John Lewis, one time Unitarian minister, philosopher, and the author of a galaxy of books and papers. T.F. Evans, university extramural lecturer, one time civil service, and a Shavian devotee of English literature. Peter Cronin, again an extramural lecturer, philosopher, critic and convivialist. And lastly, Hector Horton, novelist, journalist, editor, and a former secretary of South Place. And what is our message? We are all only too well aware that the country is in a sad state. It is, at bottom, a spiritual and a moral crisis. Politics and economics are secondary. What kind of people are we? Where do our roots lie? What kind of people do we want to be? These are personal questions. Now, some kind of religious revolution is spreading through the country, but hardly through the churches, although a few ministers in their congregations are clearly moving. But for the most part, the old denominational labels get in the way. Dead dogmas and dated forms and language are such that people quite rightly don't want to know. Yet drastic change is feasible provided painful situations are faced. And we've had some terrible crises at South Place, and got through them. Values, vision, caring relationships, doing your own thing and seeing it through, plain speaking, the rescue and the proper use of the English language. These are what a new assertion of religious humanism is about. In the 70s, or a time for social invention, for starting things, for boldness, for imagination, and for action. And the buck is to be shared, not passed. Can we do that? Bye now.